So a critical theory is Marxian economic theory juxtaposed oppositionally to what they call traditional economic theory, which is like laissez-faire classical liberalism, Manchester School uh, classical economic thought, free market theory. And uh, it's basically through this, this iteration, through this framework, that critical theory starts to assume that uh, basically all economic theory prior to Marx and then all economic theory since Marx and attempts to rebut Marx is really just kind of this veneer to uphold the capitalist uh, disparities of society, to uphold the uh, uh, a means of production where uh, ownership of capital is concentrated in the haves and the have-nots are exploited, deprived of their surplus value, uh, and therefore the Marxist system flows from that. So it becomes a, a very convenient rhetorical trick for saying that uh, all other economic uh, philosophies and systems and modes of reasoning outside of the Marxist framework are part of traditional theory and we can attack and dismiss them because uh, they exist to uh, reinforce power disparities in society and fulfill uh, this exploitative purpose of capitalism. In this episode of Liberty Curious, I invited Phil Magnus, the Director of Research and Education at AIER, to discuss the origins of critical theory, which is a neo-Marxist school of thought born in the Frankfurt School in 1923. Phil is a prolific researcher and writer on all of these kinds of ideas and topics. We discuss the history of critical theory and how it has proliferated through academia and into our culture, manifesting itself as what we commonly refer to as woke ideology. So what I'd really like to get in with you today, Phil, is to look at where critical theory comes from. Right. So maybe first we can start with just a brief definition of what critical theory is. Yeah. So critical theory, it's an intentionally imprecise term, but it refers to a classification of epistemic approaches to the world that tries to juxtapose itself against what they call traditional theory. And traditional theory uh, often, at least according to the critical theorists, puts itself forth as objective or neutral or descriptive of the world, whereas critical theory uh, positions itself almost oppositionally to that and viewing its, uh, its purpose as having a charge to change the world. And part of that change includes overturning power disparities that they claim arise from, from traditional theory. They say basically traditional theory exists as a veneer to prop up uh, the haves versus the have-nots, and critical theory exists to expose those differences uh, that occur and to overturn uh, the problems that arise allegedly from traditional theory. So basically, this is what we see when people talk about the old white males who run society, when they talk about social justice, uh, when they talk about inverting the power triangles, intersectionality, all those kinds of things are linked up with critical theory, yeah, they're, right? they're derivatives of uh, this original insight. And we can go into some of the history of the insight. But the, uh, the important thing to remember here is this is an intentionally fluid type of definitional approach. So uh, if you claim to be carrying the mantle of critical theory and you just dub anything and everything that gets in your way uh, traditional theory, it's a way to dismiss it without without actually engaging it on a charitable basis. Right. So you're changing the goalposts. Exactly. Essentially, so that you don't have to, you know, if the goalposts move, then it doesn't make sense anyway this way anymore. Well, it makes sense this way, or it doesn't make sense at all. One of the things that uh, Bruce had brought up was that if you're trying to make sense of it, you'll be accused of being Western. Right. And critical theory is kind of anti-Western at its core. Well, well they almost set up a, a rhetorical trick here. It's uh, uh, I I if you oppose critical theory, you are by definition uh, trying to prop up the power elite, trying to prop up the bourgeois, whatever the fr framework they happen to be using at the moment is. Uh, and then the only way to supposedly understand critical theory is to buy into everything that critical theory puts forth as its ideological priors. Uh, so they do a, a, a little bait and switch there where uh, uh, they'll assert epistemic proprietary rights over defining what critical theory is, but to be part of that uh, uh, that club, essentially, you have to be a critical theorist, and anyone who rejects critical theory is, by definition, uh, part of the enemy. I see, I see. So uh, critical theory, we'll, we'll talk about its roots, uh, where it stems from, which is the Frankfurt School. Right. 
Um, and and so there was also something about it where it was an offshoot of Marxism, right? Yeah. Where, it, you yeah. know, Marxism didn't quite work out. So this school of thought was kind of developed. Is that more or less correct? Yeah, so it goes uh, into the history of Marxism's dissemination itself, and I know we've done uh, several interviews and podcasts on this exact subject, uh, but the gist is that Mar Karl Marx, when he died in 1883, he's a relatively obscure figure. He's known among radical socialists, and he's known among other people that engage with that literature, but he's not at all in the academic mainstream. Uh, he just kind of dies and, and fades into uh, relative obscurity, plus he, he he's writing and uh, passes away at a time that the core of his ideas are being upended and uprooted in the economics profession because he's a labor theorist of value and that gets overturned uh, by the marginal theory of value almost contemporaneously to when Marx is writing. Uh, but the gist of it is, uh, after his death in 1883, he does have a small band of very intense devoted followers. Uh, foremost among them is his uh, colleague and collaborator and sometimes patron, Frederick Engels, uh, who basically devotes the rest of his life into celebrating the work of Karl Marx and making sure that it's translated and printed and carried on. Uh, so Engel, Engels dies in the uh, 1890s, and at the time, Marxism has moved kind of into a political mire. It's been adopted uh, by radical political movements, socialists, as, a, as one of many competing factions of socialism. There are other versions. Uh, so Marxism is explicitly revolutionary, where there are democratic socialist theorists at the time. Uh, Johann Karl Rodbertus is often seen as the main competitor in the late 19th century. Uh, Ferdinand LaSalle uh, is another competitor of the democratic socialist stripe that uh, knew Marx and they, they viciously hated each other in their own lifetime. Uh, so it's, a, it's an extremely schismatic sect, but Marxism's a segment of that. And in the 1890s, they're ascendant within radical political so, uh, social circles, sometimes around uh, uh, the Social Democratic Party of Germany has a very uh, pronounced uh, Marxist contingent, but it's all in the elite of that party. Party. And what they are discovering is that this revolutionary thrust of the Marxist message, that uh, the basis of his theory, uh, is very heavily wedded to revolutionary upheaval, uh, that's often a very difficult sell to voters and to the masses. In other words, mm -hmm. uh, Marxian revolution is supposed to be a mass proletarian uprising, but the proletariats almost never seem to uh, carry through on their supposed predicted part. And what happens is you get intellectual elites in the Marxist uh, uh, circles that appoint themselves as, you know, it's later called the vanguard theory. Uh, they appoint mm. themselves as the supposed organ organizers of the proletariats to uh, 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 enlist and engage them to what they're supposed to be doing, which is a revolutionary revol revolt. Uh, by the 1890s, uh, several Marxist theorists that were originally very sympathetic to Marxian social aims of bringing about uh, uh, a socialist system of the economy, uh, they start to realize that uh, this revolutionary uh, route has many, many obstacles ahead of it. A lot of Marx's predictions uh, that he claimed in the, uh, you know, he's writing in the uh, second half of the 19th century. Uh, das Kapital comes out in 1867, so use that as kind of a poll. Uh, he makes all these predictions about the inherent supposed contradictions of capitalism will result in the continuous immiseration of the proletariat. What well, turns out the actual observed trends by the late 19th and early 20th century are going in the opposite direction. There's an emergence of a middle class that's simply not supposed to happen according to this old orthodox Marxist theory. So what happens in, in roughly about the late 1890s to the early 1900s is you get a, a reformist movement among certain Marxist theorists. Uh, the leader of this is Edward Bernstein. Uh, he's a uh, politician and theorist with uh, in, in Germany that's associated with the, the Social Democratic Party. And he proposes an evolutionary adaptation of Marxism that looks a lot like labor reform advanced through a regular legislature. Uh, so they put out platforms calling for like a shorter workday and universal education, things that are not distinctively Marxist, but many Marxists want. Uh, so right. it becomes a much more watered down version of it. Uh, the revolutionary element starts to be kind of pushed aside or not talked about as much, at least among these evolutionary reformer uh, contingents of, uh, of Marxist thought. 
Uh, so this causes further schisms in the Marxist world. Remember, we're still talking about a radical periphery of the intellectual scene. This is not mainstream academia. It's not even mainstream. More, there are more mainstream socialists in the British tradition than there are uh, in, the, in the Marxian world, uh, but they're often working in democratic institutions, uh, so things like that. So what happens is by the 1910s or so, there is a, uh, a split in the Marxist world between these evolutionary reformers around Bernstein, uh, the watered-down version of it, and even some that still clung to the older theory uh, in Germany, but they nonetheless are advancing through a political party. And then you have an alternative sect or faction that emerges, and this comes out around a really radical, fringe, almost nobody had ever heard of them type of a figure named Vladimir Lenin. And that sect is seeking to instigate a vanguard-led revolutionary upheaval that overthrows a society and institutes a dictatorship of the proletariat, uh, brings about the socialist state, uh, utopia follows uh, the Marxian system. And Lenin is saying, look, all you reformers have it wrong. You've stripped Marx of his revolutionary thrust and power. We're trying to restore it, and we're going to act on that revolution, which, of course, we know Lenin eventually does in 1917. So that's the backstory. So then what happens is you have the Frankfurt School, which springs right. up in, I believe, 1923. So just Correct. six years after the Russian Revolution begins. Uh, it, 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 and does that stem from the same thinkers that were involved in um, the German Socialist Party? Uh, absolutely. There are overlapping figures involved in both. And what, what really happens is, so 1917 is a dramatic event for Marx's reputation. Uh, Lenin skyrockets him into fame, into the top tier of intellectual salience. And you know, we've empirically proven that. There's also uh, qualitative evidence of multiple testimonials from that era uh, about uh, prominent intellectuals that are saying, well, who's this Karl Marx guy uh, that Lenin has elevated and now suddenly he's being quoted and taken seriously everywhere? And some of the economists at that time were saying, well, we already defeated Karl Marx. His ideas are obsolete. Uh, why is he now the basis of this... Uh, this revolutionary political movement, what turns out that Lenin, uh, through a stroke of luck and uh, through certain unscrupulous actions and then taking advantage of the disorganization of a very weak government in Russia, seized control by a coup d'etat of a major world power government. What does Lenin do almost immediately, other than securing his power and putting his cronies into office and, uh, and, and basically strengthening his hold over the Russian government, uh, he also immediately goes into propagating Marxist theory through the full instruments and tax dollars of the state. Uh, don't take my word for it. The Marxist historian Eric Hobsbawm makes that exact point. He says that uh, Lenin takes Marx from an obscure intellectual doctrine, which was where it existed in the 1910s and, uh, and earlier in, in German political discussions. And uh, Hobsbawm says Marx, uh, Lenin elevates Marx into a doctrine that everyday common man workers that are part of the proletarian revolution must also learn. Uh, and, and Lenin does this through making sure copies of uh, Das Kapital and the Manifesto and then other texts that had previously uh, either been out of print or, uh, or had never even been translated are mass-produced, circulated all over the world, uh, translated into dozens of different languages. And he goes on a, uh, uh, basically an intellectual project, uh, so he sends out resources and money and scholars uh, to go mine all the archives where Karl Marx's unpublished works exist, and he mm. tasks them with trying to get it into print. Well, what's happening in Germany at the same time? So uh, almost immediately after the Russian Revolution, and this is in the aftermath of World War I, again, a time of political instability, uh, there is a Marxian-inspired attempt at a revolt in Germany over the post-war government. Uh, it's called the Spartacist Uprising. Uh, the main figures uh, is um, Rosa Luxemburg, who's a uh, revolutionary Marxist theorist uh, that has some commonality with Lenin, although she has uh, uh, distinct nuances there, but uh, very much in the revolutionary camp. Uh, the huh. Spartacist Uprising fails, uh, and uh, Luxemburg is basically executed in, in part of the process of this. Uh, so it's a really brutal time in history, but unlike the Soviets, the attempt at revolution in Germany fails. 
and there is a, uh, a reckoning among Marxist intellectuals asking the question of, well, what do we do next? And you have a right. couple of components for that. So there's the older uh, reformers from the 1910s, the 1900s and 1910s, they had basically been shoved aside. Uh, they had lost the debate with Lenin in 1917, although they, they're, they're still active, a few of them are still alive, but they're also an older generation and they're nearing the end of their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they are no longer the intellectual force. Some of them have already died off. So uh, August Babel dies in, I think, 1913, and he had been the, the party organizer of, uh, of at least that version of social democracy Marxism. Uh, but by 1919, 1920 or so, uh, there's been an upheaval and the torch has passed to the new generation of Marxists and you get uh, a couple of figures uh, that are active in that world. One of them is a philosopher by the name of Karl Korsch. And Korsch is a Marxist theorist. He's a sympathizer with these doctrines. He, he writes uh, basically a paper or an essay uh, for an academic seminar in 1922 and it's presented at the University of Frankfurt uh, to a group of younger students. And one of the major arguments of this, uh, this paper is that Lenin, whether we like him or not, and Korsh originally is, is actually kind of friendly to Lenin in this paper, although within a few years he starts seeing some of the crimes of the Soviets and suddenly changes his tune and doesn't mm. want to be associated with it. But in mm -hmm. 1922, he is saying Lenin has reinvigorated Marxism. It's rescued Marxism from this stale decline of the reformist movements that were occurring in 1900 to 1910 prior to the war. And he's done that by resuscitating the revolutionary vigor of the original theory. Uh, and he says, this is something that, uh, you know, we need intellectuals uh, to develop and propagate and, uh, and continue to work on whether they're Leninist, Leninist or not. Uh, but this is one of the birth points of the Western Marxist tradition, distinct from uh, the Soviet Leninist stuff, although it's coming with subsidy and support from the East, because Lenin has, has embarked on all these mass publication projects to make Marx's work accessible, to translate new things, and some of the money for that actually ends up at the University of Frankfurt. Uh, one of the attendees of, of, of the seminar were Korsh, and uh, um, there, there are a few other theorists at the time. Uh, uh, Georgi Lukacs, who's another uh, uh, Hungarian Marxist theorist, basically makes similar observations that Lenin has reinvigorated Marxism, and, and we need a philosophical movement now to work on this. Uh, they're all attendees at the seminar, and one of the students that's present there is an heir of a, uh, I believe it's a South American industrial fortune. Hmm. And he, so he's very much a child of privilege of the upper class, but he's a philosophical dilettante Marxist type. Uh, and he basically says, I'm going to take daddy's money and infuse it into founding a new uh, social research institute at the University of Frankfurt. Uh, that's where we get the Frankfurt uh, School. Carl Grunberg, is that his name? Uh, he, he, okay. uh, so he's one of the, yeah, one of the major figures that... Okay, so just to sum it up, so basically, so what happens here is you have the Leninist Marxist revolution that happens in the Soviet Union, 1917, and then from there you have the German Marxists who are saying, oh, you know, well, this is great, you know, but we secretly think it's great, maybe not so secretly, well, well, but... They're actually pretty public about it. They're pretty they're public about it. And but as soon as they start seeing some of the problems with Lenin, uh, I mean, Lenin's a very brutal figure. Uh, he engages in explicit political murders of his opposition. Uh, that they start to distance, uh, you know, and I'll credit that good for them, even though uh, they try to sanitize their own history with it. Right. Uh, but at least through the, the early to mid-1920s, there's enough of a nexus, an intersection between uh, the German Frankfurt School branch of Western Marxism and then the Eastern Bolshevik version uh, that you can't really easily separate it. And the other point that I make, uh, the events of 1923 onward in Germany the founding of the school probably never would have happened had they not had the successful, supposedly successful revolution occurring in uh, in uh, the Soviet Union just a few years earlier. So they needed that invigoration to start their own research program. But it's uh, after that point they start to split. I see. So so it inspired this, uh, what essentially became the Frankfurt Institute, uh, that became the Frankfurt School of Thought, which exactly. critical theory is born out of. 
And now, if we think about that on the bigger scale, critical theory is what we see in our culture here. So it's like the neo-Marxism that became the Marxist flavor of the West, and that has right. kind of just spawned and grown over time into what we see it is today. Yeah, so so it's a uh, the major figures that emerge are within that next generation. So after uh, uh, the institute is founded at Frankfurt, uh, uh, they have an infusion of money and they start hiring young academics, academics that were uh, sympathetic to Marxism, mm. and they also start bringing in other academics from other schools. To that becomes their meeting place where they hold uh, seminars and collect papers and uh, and try to advance scholarly work on Marxist theory that up until that point. Up until Lenin had been considered like a dead letter. Now it's revived. Now they have an intellectual center uh, to develop it. So one of the major figures there is a, uh, a, a philosopher by the name of Max Horkheimer. Yes. And uh, Horkheimer uh, assumes basically the leadership of the Frankfurt School in the uh, the late 1920s, early 30s. Uh, is his most active point in, in that segment. And what he does is he frames out this divide between critical and traditional theory. He writes a, a, a lengthy manuscript uh, that's now available in English, but was originally in, published in German, uh, that juxtaposes traditional theories versus critical theories. And he says the origin point of critical theory is an epistemic approach uh, he says there are two historical examples prior to the actual coining of critical theory as the Frankfurt School uh, that we turn to. And he says, uh, uh, you know, the first is a, a deep uh, philosophical work. It's Immanuel Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, which was a, an outsider attempt to uh, uh, cause upheaval through the previous way of, uh, of philosophical discourse. Right. Uh, so he says that's kind of the framework. But then he says the second, the major thing, and this is where they take the name from, is Karl Marx. Uh, so Capital, Das Kapital, uh, uh, his masterwork, one volume published in his lifetime, two successor volumes edited by Engels that lays out the full uh, thrust of the Marxist economic system. The subtitle of it is A Critique of Political Economy. So a critical theory is Marxian economic theory juxtaposed oppositionally to what they call traditional economic theory, which is like laissez-faire classical liberalism, Manchester School, uh, classical economic thought, free market theory. And uh, it's basically through this, this iteration, through this framework, that critical theory starts to assume that uh, basically all economic theory prior to Marx and then all economic theory since Marx and attempts to rebut Marx is really just kind of this veneer to uphold the capitalist uh, disparities of society, to uh, uphold the uh, uh, a means of production where uh, ownership of capital is concentrated in the haves and the have-nots are exploited, deprived of their surplus value, uh, and therefore the Marxist system flows from that. So it becomes a, a very convenient rhetorical trick for saying that uh, all other economic uh, philosophies and systems and modes of reasoning outside of the Marxist framework are part of traditional theory and we can attack and dismiss them because uh, they exist to uh, reinforce power disparities in society and fulfill uh, this exploitative purpose of capitalism. Uh, whereas we, as, as good Marxists, in our critique of political economy, our objective is to overturn capitalism because we've already deemed it as inherently wrong and Marx has supposedly scientifically shown that it's inherently flawed, inherently exploitative, uh, that uh, uh, the, the course of history will overturn it, and now we, the critical theorists, are the agents of doing that through the way that we approach uh, scholarly endeavors. And this allows a basis to where they're not confined to the economics profession anymore. Uh, Marx, even though he's writing as an economist, as a, crit uh, a critic of other economists for an audience that is, is basically economic and it's grounding, uh, although he's, he's a radical fringe of that audience, but it's certainly, uh, I mean, you read the text, his targets are economists. His mm. intended contribution is a new economic theory. But that hits a dead end among the eyes of peer economists. Uh, it basically goes nowhere in the economics profession and is rendered obsolete. John Maynard Keynes calls it an obsolete textbook of no interest to the modern world at this exact moment in history, early 1920s. But what you have with Karl Marx is uh, an economist that's writing to attack an economic system. The Frankfurt School can shift gears and take that framework into other non-economic dimensions. Uh, so uh, let's assume Marxian economics is correct because they take that as an ideological axiom. 
Uh, let's apply that now to literary studies and criticism. Let's apply it to musicology, which uh, there was some element of that. Uh, Theodore Adorno is one of the major figures that comes out of that generation of the Frankfurt School. Uh, let's apply it to sociology. And there's actually a movement in sociology that displaces the classical liberal theorist Herbert Spencer with Karl Marx as supposedly a founder of the discipline, even though sociologists in the 19, 1900, 1910, most of them have no idea who Marx is, or if they do critique, um, or they do engage him, that's very critically. Uh, afterwards, you know, you move Marxism in a sociological direction, you absorb and carry over the economic theories as priors, but they're not questioned on economic terms, and they're just applied in sociological or anthropological or literary or law or education and pedagogy. So this becomes the thrust of the Frankfurt School. Now there's a diaspora of Frankfurt School theorists as a direct result of Nazi suppression of Marxism in World War II and in the years before that. Oh, So okay, wait. Before we get into <laughs> that, though, I would really like to get into there, but I just wanted to zone in on one point that you said earlier. You talked about Immanuel Kant as well. And so it was kind right. of like a deadly cocktail between... Marx's theories and Immanuel Kant. Marx's theory and, and, and continental <laughs> philosophy. I mean, Kant is a very complex figure that uh, he, there isn't a single school of Kantians that follow from him. There are Kantian liberals. There are Kantian illiberal thinkers uh, that spread out after uh, after his work. I mean, he's one of these these uh, major figures of philosophical tradition that inspires a whole bunch of different directions of inquiry. Uh, but one of those is a continental philosophy tradition that emerges in his wake uh, that is often uh, epistemically uh, in tension with, separate and apart from the socialist proclivities, uh, but it's epistemically in tension with uh, kind of the Scottish Enlightenment style analytic political, uh, reason-based philosophy that's emerging mostly in the English-speaking world. But but did, uh, so you know, did Kant also exactly. see things, I, I remember reading this somewhere, I may be wrong, but did he also see things in terms of power dynamics? I, I mean, there's certainly elements of that that comes through in Kant's political writings, but it, it's, it's not like his sole framework. Okay. Uh, I mean, Kant is fundamentally like a, an epistemologist. Uh, he's trying to discern principles of reason. Uh, and he has uh, certain liberal influences. So David Hume, for example, is one of the precursors that flows into Kantian philosophy. And Kant explicitly credits Hume, but uh, he also takes it in some slightly different directions. He's an ethical theorist of sorts as well, just a multifaceted figure. Uh, but but I, I guess the way of summarizing that is that there, there's no single true claimant to Immanuel Kant, although there are derivative philosophical traditions that later became sympathetic to and embracing of Marxism okay. and uh, are able to reinforce uh, Marxist theory by drawing on certain earlier insights, I guess would be the best way of putting it. So that. then the Frankfurt School uh, and their idea of critical theory sounds like it's just kind of a mishmash of different things yep. that, you know, might not be coherent altogether. Uh, that, that's right. Uh, I say not even coherent in the sense that, uh, I mean, you read these texts, they are dense, jargon-filled, hundreds of pages to say what I would argue could be summarized in 10 pages as an argument. Uh, and it's part of a proprietary mechanism here to, uh, uh, you know, you have to buy into the terminology and the language and the method of discourse in order to be a part of the Frankfurt School or be a part of this uh, critical theory approach to understanding uh, philosophy. And again, it's back to that point. If you buy into it, you also accept the ideological priors. And if you dispute those ideological priors, then they'll say, well, you're not a true uh, theorist. Uh, you're not a true critical theorist. You don't understand what we're doing. Right. Uh, so, so it's a real... Uh, wishy-washy epistemic trick that they play uh, using rhetorical tactics rather than reason. And, uh, and, you know, this becomes kind of a hallmark of the Frankfurt School, although it's still a fair, fairly obscure entity. Mm -hmm. So in the Nazi era, they are a distinct minority of, uh, of German academia, and they are targeted. Uh, we see that also in, in the citation work I've done. If you look at German citations of Karl Marx, they take off in 1917, and they uh, continue to rise in the 1920s, and then 1933, they drop back down in Germany, but not the rest of the world. Why? Because Marx had been added to the banned book lists uh, uh, by the Nazi government. But part of that also is that the German academic left flees Germany. 
Right. They spread out to other institutions, and a lot of the Frankfurt School theorists, they, they basically pick up and they escape to the United States. Some of them also were persecuted for other reasons. There were several uh, Jewish members of it, uh, but there's also uh, communists in general were banned and targeted by the, the German government. So they, they flee uh, Germany just as other academics that are outside <coughs> of the Nazi philosophical system do. So on the free market side, Ludwig von Mises is in kind of the same boat. He's a Jewish Austrian economist that espouses free market theory and pretty radical free market theory. And he's on the target list by the Nazis when they take over Austria. Uh, he basically escapes, just narrowly escapes as they are coming to arrest him uh, and makes his way into Switzerland at first and sets up refuge at a uh, uh, university in Switzerland, a uh, research institute there, and then moves to the United States after, at the, uh, the tail end of the war. But the Frankfurt School theorists also follow the same pattern, and a lot of them end up in New York City at Columbia University, where they kind of reconstitute after the war. And the thing you notice in their citation patterns is they're, they're very, very slim in what's supposedly the high watermark of the 1920s Frankfurt School nexus uh, in Germany. And they continue to piddle along at uh, very, very low levels until after World War II. Uh, and there, one, I guess the first that really kind of burst into the scene is Eric Fromm, uh, some, some of his uh, psychoanalysis work, which comes out of a Frankfurt School tradition, uh, starts to pick up. Uh, at the tail end of World War II in particular, but the first major Frankfurt School theorist that kind of burst into the academic mainstream is uh, Herbert Marcuse, who's one of that original generation with Horkheimer and Adorno and Marcuse are the uh, uh, kind of considered the, the, the founding figures of that era. And he relocates to the United States and becomes uh, kind of like this guru of the new left philosophical uh, tradition, the new left philosophical world in academia, in American academia in the early 1960s or so. Uh, and that's that's basically where you start to see a, a salient emergence of critical theory as a prominent school of academic thought. It's really the 1960s United States. So that's where it starts to move, I guess, if I understand correctly, from being kind of almost like a click into being like a click that's expanding. It's like kind of this exclusive club and then it gets kind of more uh, popular and then it starts to uh, bleed into the mainstream of academia. Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, Marcuse is a, a major figure in that era. Uh, and, you know, he also articulates philosophical doctrines that are expressly hostile uh, to what he sees as the manifestations of power disparity out of uh, traditional theory. Uh, so he, he argues that basically... Uh, uh, critical theorists are justified in applying intolerance to certain ideas that uh, he deems to uphold the uh, the power structures of society uh, because part of the emancipatory mission is to tear them right. down. Uh, so therefore, it's perfectly fine to exclude them from uh, uh, the discourse, exclude them from the range of what are permissible opinions in free speech. Uh, so he takes that in a very illiberal direction in a, in a fairly notorious essay he writes in the mid-1960s uh, on this subject. Uh, but he also has generations of, uh, of graduate students that are involved in uh, a variety of different directions of, uh, of radical academic activism. So uh, one of his most famous students, uh, dissertation students, is Angela Davis of the Black Power Movement. Uh, and she has, uh, I mean, she's a Marxist theorist in her own right, and she takes that in a, a bit of a different direction, but um, it, it spends most of the 1970s basically running away from the police because she's uh, implicated in some uh, uh, criminal revolutionary activity activity, uh, ends up fleeing to like East Germany and uh, does the tour of the Soviet world. Wow. And, uh, Goes home. Real, really horrendous <laughs> things about the, the, some, some of the worst, most brutal, murderous regimes of the 20th century before she comes back to U.S. academia. Um, but but it's really the 1960s. You can see this in Marcuse's citation counts and then the other crit theory uh, thinkers that are operating in his circle they were of that that first generation of the Frankfurt School, their citations start to take off in the 1960s. Uh, so mm -hmm. you see them entering into the academic mainstream. By then, there's another generation of uh, critical theorists, uh, multiple other generations. There's also a reconstituted Frankfurt School in Frankfurt. So the next generation of, uh, of critical theorists comes up there. And they're, um, again, 
similar uh, uh, similar characteristics. They all tend to be Marxists, but Marxists in a direction that isn't explicitly economic. They're philosophical Marxists. Right. Uh, they often have schisms between them. Uh, Jürgen Habermas is, is probably the most prominent figure of that second generation, uh, and he kind of comes of age in the 1960s to the present day as uh, the next iteration of the original Frankfurt School critical theory tradition, although by then there's been hivings out in all sorts of different directions of applying this critical theory methodology, again with the inherited just default assumption that Marxian economics are right, uh, and applying it all over the place. So you start getting outcroppings of critical theory that are applied to very specific areas or segments of society. And so... This is critical. Yes. Social is, justice, yeah. feminism too, I believe. There's a bunch of different things. But if we um, compare that, you know, critical theory with traditional theory, is traditional theory basically just kind of classical theory, like what you would think about in terms of like enlightenment way of looking at things, the Western tradition of, uh, you know, scientific uh, inquiry and reason, like, is that... It's uh, it's what what is uh, rooted in the Enlightenment, at least the most recent uh, iteration of it before critical theory comes in and tries to to seek its upheaval. Uh, but it's also something traditional theory goes all the way back to the ancient world, and there are interpretations of, of traditional theory that these are uh, you know they're philosophical inquiries that position themselves. The claim is that they're, they 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 position themselves as seekers of truth of. Uh, uh, objective observers of the world trying to discern the world, and the critical theorist says, well, we need to interrogate that because they aren't really objective observers. They're just providing rationalizations to prop up power disparities that we don't like, and our purpose of interrogating them is to emancipate the world from these power disparities that have been entrenched into philosophy, into culture, into uh, anthropological assessment, sociological assessment, you name it, uh, across the world. Uh, and then even by the late 1960s, so there's a whole movement uh, that emerges in education schools. It's called critical pedagogy. Mm. And it's a derivative out outcropping of critical theory. Uh, there's some overlap in some of the theorists where they train, but it's but it, it seen as, a, as an outgrowth. So it's a new school unto itself, a, a, a version of critical theory applied to education in the classroom. And it, it basically juxtaposes traditional education as like the re recitation of facts, the recitation of methods and figures, uh, what most people think of uh, when uh, they view K through 12 education. They say, well, a critical pedagogy uh, is something that tries to instill a form of activism in the students uh, to overturn yeah, we and, see that and, now. and overthrow. We uh, see that all structures. over public yeah. schools now, right? So it is. And some of the critical pedagogy texts, uh, Paulo Freire's uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed is like one of the most assigned wow. books in education schools. And this is a, a, a Marxist uh, crit theory adaptation of pedagogy uh, that's put forth as like a manual of what a teacher is supposed to be doing in the, in the classroom and what are they supposed to be doing? Overthrow neoliberalism, overthrow capitalism, overthrow all these horrible things that uh, uh, are used as like the boogeymen uh, from the crit theory perspective because they're upholding uh, power structures of the haves against the have-nots. So, okay, we saw that the Leninist Marxists were very ambitious and they were very successful. And we mm -hmm. talked about that in our last podcast, which I definitely recommend people to go watch the full thing because it really gives a good background of the Russian Revolution and of, of Leninism and that strain of Marxism. But here with critical theory and the Frankfurt School, we could see that they're also very successful. They've brought these ideas into the West. It's proliferated here. We see it all over the place. But do you think that they had those intentions or do you think that they, in a way, thought that these kind of ideas would just stay in academia and they could have their debates about it and they could kind of enjoy talking about it and writing about it without actually seeing it play out in the real world? Like, Do you think they were as ambitious as Lenin, let's say? Right, right. Well, they uh, they actually come at odds with Lenin for very clear reasons because the the political methods Lenin and his successors Stalin in particular use are like linked to genocide and atrocity, and no sane person wants their legacy associated with that. Uh, there are still some like uh, 
genocide deniers that, that, that assert that Stalin was unfairly blamed, but that's a real weird Stalinist extremist fringe of the Marxist world. Critical theorists generally, once those crimes were out in the public, they didn't want to be associated with that. Uh, so they're, they're basically arguing for a way to apply Marxist economic theories through other disciplines and push them forward without the Soviet state and its baggage attached to them. Uh, even though many of them were were rah-rah for the Soviet mm -hmm. state at its outset, uh, that, that they're like, oh, we don't want to be associated with that anymore. Let's pretend that it's a, a different yes. tradition. Uh, but, but, but you know what, you, you get in academia, and I, and I say this, so I, I don't think there's like a critical theory Frankfurt School conspiracy to take over the universities. What I do think is the universities are institutionally... Uh, situated to reward certain types of incentives. And the first and foremost thing that any academic wants in a university system is a secure job with lots of cushy perks of that job, of uh, you know, it's, whether it's tenure, it's being able to teach a relatively low course load, it's being able to work on something that is intellectually interesting to you, so it's almost a consumption good as their their, their job in addition to teaching. Um, there's, there's all sorts of perks and status that comes with being a university professor. Uh, so what does this mean? If you are a uh, champion of a certain faction or school of thought in the university, of course you want to get more resources for that school of thought. You want institutes and centers and departments that build up around it. And then when you are involved in hiring decisions of new faculty, you want to get other people who think like you because they'll vote the same way as you do in department meetings. And they'll also hire other critical theorists. Uh, they'll also uh, uh, take a pedagogical approach that tries to instill a certain form of left-wing activism. Uh, so it's kind of a self-reinforcing mechanism in that sense. And then the university system itself is a rent-seeking entity that extracts public resources through the taxpayers to devote to uh, intellectual right. careers. Some of it said for good. I mean, we, we invest in universities because we want biological innovation to discover new medicine. We also invest in universities because we want an educated public that knows Shakespeare and uh, uh, understands philosophical reasoning and can do mathematics. And uh, we invest in universities because we want a place to send our kids uh, so they can get educated and get better jobs. These are all the public justifications for putting money in universities. But what it plays out in the real world is uh, like a competition for resources internal to the university system where instead of uh, uh, we educate everyone in Shakespeare, the English department uh, uh, gets control of certain resources and they start requiring English composition classes that are supposedly about teaching writing, but it's all about socialist activism and, uh, and gender climate change Gender ideology activism and, and, uh, and intersectionality and exactly. power dynamics mm -hmm. and all of that. But I mean, it makes sense too in... And if you think about it in a non-nefarious way, kind of as you're describing here about incentives, is that if you're kind of in that position where you're studying critical theory, you're teaching critical theory, you're pretty cushioned from uh, the real world outside of academia. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you see this in the way that they describe themselves. Uh, I mean, I often joke that... Uh, uh, even though most academics, they come from upper middle class backgrounds, uh, they're well educated, they've, they've basically lived mm -hmm. a life of privilege. Uh, very few of them have had to work uh, nine to five jobs. Uh, there are people that uh, have been in education systems from kindergarten all the way through their PhD, uh, which is often into their early 30s. So the first 30 years of their life doing nothing mm -hmm. but full time school. Uh, so they're often very, very well educated, uh, but they come from uh, backgrounds that uh, are, are definitely not the proletariat that they are claiming to act on behalf of. And yet the way that they approach their university positions, it's like cosplaying as proletariats. Because you ask every single philosophy, English, sociology uh, professor that comes out of this particular perspective, which is almost all of them these days because of the ideological skew in, on campus, you ask them all, they insist that they have been exploited by their administrations. They insist that they've been uh, deprived of the resources that's owed to them by the state. They insist that austerity has put them on economic straits uh, to where they're barely tying loose ends together, barely getting by. Uh, so they adopt the same rhetoric to describe themselves and they, they, they actually truly believe it, I think, most of them. But if you look at it from the outsider perspective, uh, so is the university administration really exploiting its faculty, its proletarian faculty, on behalf of the neoliberals or behalf of, on behalf of the corporatized university? You know, that rhetoric's everywhere. But if you actually do surveys of university administrators, they're even further to the left than the faculty. Yeah, I, 
So uh, what, what, it, what really happens is university administrators become an extension of jobs placement, jobs program for overproduced left-wing social yes. activist PhDs. Uh, they can't get a job in the English or philosophy department, so now they're, they get a job in the admissions oh. office. And we've seen that trend over the last 20 to 30 years really take off with administrative growth. Uh, so this perception that they have of themselves, you know, to make a long story short, the perception they have of themselves as also being the victims that they're advocating on behalf of is just completely out of touch with empirical reality of the university system. Uh, if you ask them, and I just reviewed a book that made this claim, uh, if you ask a critical theorist in the university system, they think universities are like the, uh, uh, the institutionalized face of uh, laissez-faire big business capitalism. Uh, which is, I mean, anyone from the outside looks at that. There, there, there's uh, how out of touch with reality do you have to be to say that with a, a straight face? And then all the empirical metrics of like ideology on campus show the exact opposite that uh, universities have become very institutionally left wing. Yeah, in no. Their I, I totally, totally can see that picture and how that has kind of grown into that in that way. And maybe um, we're running out of time here, so I'll ask you for some last thoughts, but maybe next time we can get into, you know, some of the other ways that, that the uh, neo-Marxist thought has spread, if we think about it from a more nefarious lens of, of the idea that this was also done at least partly on purpose. You know, maybe there was... Uh, like I said in our last podcast, Marx, uh, sorry, Lenin was was quite successful, and Karl Marx was quite successful in, in spreading uh, his sure. ideology, and and we see that now here through critical theory and how that has spread through the institutions and and through civil life and social life and culture. So, any last thoughts before you go? <laughs> uh, well, I think on that exact point, uh, uh, cr critical theory derivatives of Marxism are a way to resuscitate Marxist economic doctrine after the empirical failure that we experienced across the 20th century of attempts to implement top-down Marxist systems. Uh, Soviet Union, Maoist China, and the list of, of, of examples goes on and on from there. Uh, but every single case, whether it's China, Soviet Union, uh, Pol Pot's Cambodia, Castro's Cuba, Hugo Chavez's Venezuela, they all end in humanitarian disasters of economic immiseration, starvation, and often genocide, mass murders, killing fields, gulags. Uh, this has been the atrocious track record of state Marxism in the 20th century. Well, what do we have in critical theory? It's a, it's a way to resuscitate and retain Marxist economic priors without having to claim that baggage of all these horrendous human, humanitarian costs of socialism. So after 1991, when the Soviet Union fell, everyone thought, well, Marxism's a dead letter. It's been defeated in the battle of ideas and in the practical uh, applications. Uh, th this is a, a dead end of economic sciences. It's a dead end of study. Uh, so Marxism will wither away and become like a historical doctrine that we talk about associated with that era. Well, what's really happened since then, in the past uh, 30 years since the fall of the Soviet Union, initially there's a dip in, in uh, Marxist theory, but it's been revived in this critical theory direction. And the other interesting thing about it is the critical theory Marxists are distinct from the classical orthodox Marxists, and they all hate each other. They despise each other because the classical orthodox Marxist says to the critical theorist, no, 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 you have the conflict of society uh, identified in the wrong way. Marx said society is split along class lines and class, uh, collective class actions are the mechanism that drives history forward. It's the proletariat versus the bourgeois, and our aim is for the proletarian revolution to seize the means of production and institute uh, uh, this Marxian socialist system of, uh, of sharing everything and utopia will follow. Uh, but it, it was the class divide that's the mechanism, and it's the fact that the proletarian class is a far more nu numerical uh, advantage than anyone that's at the top, so eventually history has to arc toward that. Uh, whereas the critical theorists come along and say, well, no, we're, we're, we're uh, 
uh, we're viewing the, the divide on different lines. And, and let's say we have critical race theory, which is an explicit adaptation of critical theory on racial terms. Now it's, uh, it's racial designations that are the mechanism of the conflict. And a traditional Marxist is going to look at that and say, no, you got it all wrong. Uh, uh, I mean, it's almost a religious fervor. They said, Das Kapital doesn't say uh, race is the dividing line. It'll say uh, class is the dividing line. So they hate each other. And they have these different schismatic uh, trends, and the traditional orthodox Marxists will say the critical theory Marxists are not true Marxists. And the critical theory Marxists will say, well, the orthodox Marxists got something wrong, and we need to uh, go in a different direction. But at the end of the day, their economics, they're like a 99% agreement on everything, and it's that, that difference of, the, of uh, the remainder that causes them to hate each other. Uh, and yet, to the external world, that's not part of this uh, academic milieu of, uh, of Marxist thought. Uh, we look at them externally. Yeah, and say, well, they're all. Are crazy. <laughs> uh, they're so, OK, you know, so so and, so one last question yeah. then really quick, because I think that you just brought out something really interesting there between the orthodox Marxist and the critical theorists. So would you also say that the critical theorists only want to destroy and, and dismantle and the orthodox Marxist want to dismantle to rebuild utopia? Is that also a difference? Uh, I, I would say that there are probably more pronounced utopian predictions in the orthodox Marxist system, even though they'll disavow it. They'll say these are our scientific predictions, but it, it does basically veer in a utopian direction. Uh, the critical theory Marxists, there's a bit more of a diversity of aims there. Uh, because a lot of it is uh, small-level political activism to change a specifically targeted policy. Uh, so you do get a, a diversity of style there. And, uh, uh, you know, the revolutionary, revolutionary element is dampened and reoriented to uh, uh, microcosm battles in the critical theory world, whereas the orthodox version. So, so it'll be a, a small battle to, well, we need to seize the campus <laughs> climate and uh, and make sure our uh. university is, is uh, uh, like a true manifestation of, of the worker utopia that we, we all oh, uh, interesting. Uh, but you go to any university and they're, they're, they're some of the most dysfunctional institutions and entities in our entire society. They make the, the Department of Motor Vehicles look like a beacon <laughs> of, of hope and, and functionality. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, God help us if these people ever uh, uh, extend uh, how they behave in university systems to the rest of society uh, because it does end in, in just like bureaucratized, nonsensical mess. Well, Phil, I think I it. just got the title for this podcast, Critical Theory, Microcosms of Utopia. I think that's... <laughs> right. Uh, well, thank it's you fun. so much. I can't wait to talk about this more. Super interesting topic. Thank you so much, Phil Magnus, for being here today. People can follow you on Twitter, read all of your work at AIR.org. And... Um, yeah, hope to talk to you about this again soon. Absolutely. Thanks.